Hey, this is Gen X Amplified episode number 23. And I am so excited today because we truly have a marketing communications and social media expert on the podcast today because my guest used to be the head of social media for not just one of the biggest car brands in the world, but probably one of the most influential companies ever. And he's here to talk about not only that, but also his new journey as an entrepreneur. And he's going to shed some insight on the current state of social media. So are you ready? Let's do it. So as you're thinking about, you know, establishing some thought leadership, understand what the greater purpose is. If it's for the sake of your own career, then there are outlets to, to go to to consider that. Welcome, welcome to Gen X Amplified, where we bring you inspirational and entertaining conversations with successful Gen X leaders and entrepreneurs. This is the show created just for you. The powerful generation between the boomers and millennials to help you amplify your story, maximize your impact, and become gen exceptional in business and in life. Now, now, here's your host, Adrian Porter. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Gen X Amplified, the podcast for you the powerful generation of leaders between those brilliant boomers and those magnificent millennials. Thank you, as always, for listening in and spending time with me, with us. I really, really appreciate it. Um, So if you're ready to get some great insights on social media, content, and marketing in general, then you are in for a treat. That's because my guest is an internationally recognized thought leader in digital communications, social media, and marketing. Now, for six years, he was best known for being the global head of social media at Ford Motor Company, where he advised on social media activities across the entire company. So if any time between 2008 and 2014, you were motivated via social media to buy a Mustang Explorer Ford Fusion or Expedition, you can thank my guest. Um, He also has a decade of experience at marketing agencies where he worked with clients, including Coca-Cola, American Airlines, T-Mobile, and IBM. Now, he recently launched his own consultancy where he advises brands and agencies on strategy communications, influencer management, and the overall customer digital experience. Now, in addition to his professional duties, He is an active blogger and fellow podcaster, not only on his personal website, but also a site and podcast called, now get this, I Hear Sherlock of, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, excuse me, um, dedicated to none other than Sherlock Holmes. Now, he frequently speaks at events around the world and has been featured on a variety of mainstream media, including the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg TV, NBC, CNN. NPR, Fox Business, and now Gen X Amplified. <laughs> so everyone, please welcome today's Gen Exceptional guest, the one and only Scott Monty. Scott, what's going on, man? Wow, that guy sounds impressive. How did you book him? I don't know. You know, somebody <laughs> somebody dropped off an envelope of money um, yesterday at the door, <laughs> and they gave me it. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing so well. First, I want to say congratulations on the new venture of launching you. your own business. I know that was a big moment for you, and it was fairly recently, right? It was, and, it, yeah. and, and it's called Scott Monty Strategies, correct? Well, what else? Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, um, I decided to finally uh, strike out on my own in uh, June of 2015. Right. It's something I had considered for a while, but I always found an excuse or two to get in the way. You know, there, there's never a perfect time for any of this stuff. Right. And, and you feel like you're always waiting for the planets to align. And finally, I just said, you know what? Um, a, I'm not getting any younger. Uh, <laughs> B, I'm moving farther and farther away from the time that I spent at Ford, so it becomes less relevant. Right. Um, so it was time to pull a ripcord. 
No, I, I, I hear you. And, you know, again, that was that's a fascinating jump. And, you know, as you mentioned, you know, you were just, and as I mentioned in the intro, you spent a lot of time at Ford, which I want to briefly get to, but I want to talk more about your new ventures. But, uh, you know, venturing out on your own journey, um, and I can speak for it personally, it can be uh, a scary point in your life, but mm-hmm. also it can be very rewarding. And, you know, and again, I am really thrilled, you know, really to have you here. I've been checking out your content and your story for quite a bit. Um, I actually remembered you being featured on um, Jay Baird's Social Pros Baseball Cards project, <laughs> yeah. right? Which That's right. I, I believe you were the first one in that deck, I, I, if, I, if my memory serves me correctly. But uh, I thought that was a, a very exciting and pretty cool project that Jay did. And, and beyond that, I mean, I've been seeing your content and I first you know, heard about you during your venture with Ford. So, you know, Scott, I really want to dig into your story and what you're doing now with the consultancy. But I want to briefly, because I think it's it, it warrants some notice, um, just talk about your fascinating role at Ford. For me, I would love to know, like, how did you get that role as the global head of social media? Because, and you can correct me, but I'm not sure if that role even existed prior to your tenure. And then also, can you just tell us briefly what's your most memorable moment working in that role? Sure. Um so I was working at a strategic consultancy that specialized in helping big brands understand social media strategy. Okay. So um, we, we were virtual and uh, we were connected. We you know had all of our calls on Skype and we IM'd and uh, we had an office in Second Life, if you can uh, believe that. Wow, I remember Second Life. <laughs> yeah, and, and Second Life is still around. That's the amazing thing. Oh, wow. It's, it, it's like MySpace. It, it just never goes away. It reinvents itself. <laughs> right, right. So it gets, I was it, gets a sec, it gets a second life, a third life, and a fourth life, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I was doing that for about a year. Right. And I got a call from uh, the VP of communications at Ford Motor Company. Okay. And he said, look, we've been following your stuff. Um, you know, I, I obviously had a blog as well. Um we think you'd be great at this role that we've just created. Mm-hmm. And uh, we chatted for a little bit. I wanted to understand what Ford's challenges were uh, because, uh, quite frankly, I wasn't following Ford. I, I'm i not a car guy. Okay. Um, and never have been. Uh, and, you know, I, I didn't really have any particular brand loyalties. Um, hmm. So he kind of filled me in as to what the company had been up to. And, um, you know, it was a great conversation. And, and uh, ultimately, I said, well, sounds like an interest op- interesting opportunity. Do I have to move to Detroit? Okay. Because, remember, I was working virtually. Right. Now, where were you, where were you residing at I that was, time? I was in the Boston area. Okay. Okay. I'd been there for 20 years. Okay. Um, I grew up in New England. So, you know, I, that's where my heart and home were. Right. And I figured, you know, you can do this kind of thing from anywhere. And he said, "No, nah, this this is a, this is an executive role. We need you at the at the world headquarters." And I said, mm, I'm "Not interested." <laughs> you weren't you weren't that tempted to go to the greener pastures of Detroit, <laughs> Michigan? Go figure, right? <laughs> um, which you know now, you know the 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 city's on a comeback. So oh yeah, definitely. Exciting yeah. stuff going on here. Oh but yeah. I just you know it, it was a it was a big move you know taking on a, a corporate responsibility like that and uprooting my my family and everything i knew to to plant myself down in another city right it was a big deal so i said yeah i said i said the timing's just not right and uh, he said okay and in the ensuing months i started following ford a lot more closely anytime ford was mentioned in the news my ears uh, you know kind of perked up and I watched what was happening there, and, and the new CEO, Alan Mulally, his pledge was to turn the company around and start uh, generating a profit by 2009. Okay. So April of 2008 rolls around, and the company uh, filed a $100 million quarterly profit. And I thought, well, they're, they're already ahead of plan. Right. This is great. So we reconnected. And he's uh, my, my same contact said um, we still haven't filled the position. Um, we've interviewed about fifty people. Your name kept coming up, so 
why don't you just come out here and check us out? Mm-hmm. You know, no commitment necessary. Just get a sense as to what's going on here. I said, all right. So I did that, and boy, almost as soon as I walked in the door, I was just blown away. I mean, the history of the company and, and of the expansion of America is staring you right in the face because Henry Ford made cars affordable for every American. And it's what allowed, you know, the expansion across the United States. It's what allowed the quick expansion of so many companies in the uh, manufacturing and industrial uh, era. Oh, right. Um, And I'm like, this is history. And and I have a chance to be part of it. So um, at that point, I was all but convinced. Uh, So I went and told my wife and she cried and... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> were they happy tears or were they young? Uh, not at first, no. no. <laughs> okay. Not until I brought her out for a visit as well. Okay. And, um, you know, we For, Ford's not located in the city anyway. It's in Dearborn, which is about 10 miles outside of Detroit. Okay. And then we were looking at, uh, you know, communities about 20 miles uh, further out uh, from there. And, you know, there, there are just some really great towns in Michigan, a great place to raise a family, and it's such a diverse uh, kind of landscape from, you know, the, the, the beaches to the mountains, the forests. Um, it's, it's just a really amazing state. So we've been quite happy here, and it was the best decision I could have made in my career. Oh, that's great. Now, it's good that you uh, <clears throat> recognize that full circle. I mean, I understand, you know, Growing up and being born and raised in, in one state and city in, in Boston um, and asked to, you know, really pack your bags. And, you know, it sounds like a great opportunity, but, you know, you never know you know what's going to happen. But it sounds like once you really got a chance to taste the, the historical relevance and the, the, the magnitude of the opportunity, you know, it sounds like and it sounds like you uh, you made the best one, of the best decisions you ever made um, in your life. Yeah. And, and, you know, change, no matter what kind of change it is, change is always hard. Right. You know, going from what you know and what you're comfortable in to something that's unknown, uncertain, um, you know, you, maybe you don't have any other contacts there. And it could be, you know, walking into a party for the first time and being the only one there and, you know, you know not, not knowing anyone else and in a room of uh, dozens, if not hundreds of people. Right. That can be quite intimidating. Oh, yes. And, and usually in those circumstances, what it takes is just one friendly face to, you know, kind of physically or metaphorically uh, put their arm around your shoulder and lead you through the room and introduce you to other people and make you feel at home. And, and I think that applies, that applies in business. It applies in, um, you know, just life changes or, or what have you. And... You know, when I when I took on the role at Ford, there were very few people who were doing what I did. Right. Um, and there was a, a there was a fledgling um, uh, industry council that was forming of people that were heads of social media for Fortune 500 companies. And you know, you you go from being a stranger in a strange land to uh, someone surrounded with other people that have the same kinds of challenges, that have the same kinds of questions, and uh, there's a wonderful support network there. Right. No, that's great. And you, I mean, you really, Scott, you made, I mean, making a name for yourself is an understatement. And, you know, and I really shouldn't say, not just for yourself, but for the company, um, you you became the face of Ford Social. Um, and I believe there were a couple of uh, significant firsts that happened under your watch. Um, one involved debuting, debuting a vehicle on Facebook for the first time. Is that correct? That's right. That was uh, July of 2010. Okay. Um, and, you know, not a lot of people can remember that far back, but Facebook was very different than it is now. Oh, yes. And um, nobody was really doing much in the way of marketing new vehicles. I mean, folks had a page or whatever, but nobody used Facebook as the place where you're actually going to reveal the new vehicle before. So we went so far beyond what could be done at an auto show with a limited audience Mm -hmm. and just opened it up to the masses. And it was extraordinarily well received. We actually had a, um, a bigger impact than had we taken out a Super Bowl ad. Wow, <laughs> that's crazy. And then, then a Super Bowl ad. I mean, not many people would, would would understand that. But that was a big moment. And then uh, was it now Google Plus 
is it true Ford was the first brand on Google Plus? Yeah, that's right. Um, we we saw the uh, potential for that uh, very early on, and uh, we we cr- created a page for Ford actually before pages were even allowed. Uh, now Ford was obviously a very uh, large advertiser with Google, still is. Right. Um, and we use that uh, as a relationship building opportunity with the Google staff to say, okay, we want to help you guys with where we think Google Plus is going. Right. Um, and we'd like to be able to have the freedom to do what we want to do as well. And we work together to, you know, really promote that. Now, uh, for plenty of reasons. Um, Google Plus hasn't taken off or hasn't had the staying power that they hoped that it would. But Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I, just, I was curious to hear your opinion about the state of Google Plus and, uh, since you were part of that, that moment with Ford. Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of sad to see what's happened to it. I, I don't think Google's ever really had a good grasp of social. Okay. They've, they've had more failures than they've had successes. Um, they, do, they do utilities really well. They do obviously search. Uh, they do email extraordinarily well. As a matter of fact, just yesterday I saw an announcement that the new inbox version of Google, uh, of Gmail, mm-hmm. um, is going to have some artificial intelligence built into it. So oh, when wow. someone asks if you're available next week to uh, have a meeting and there's vacation time on your calendar, mm-hmm. it will automatically reply from your account that you're on va- that you're going to be on vacation next week. So oh. you don't even have to bother with that kind of drudgery. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's very cool. It's right. very cool. And and um, you know, Facebook is working on uh, AI. So you know, I think we're we're going to see more of this. But but Google, ha- that's where its strength has been. It's been in the tools. It's been in the products. It hasn't been in creating a social network or right. in Google Plus's case is a social layer that goes on top of all of these tools. Right. And I think the mistake there is that when people sign up for YouTube or uh, uh, Gmail or, or Blogger or Google Analytics or whatever it is, there's no expectation of having a social layer. <laughs> right. So you, you have all these Google tools and then Google says, well, boom, now it's, it's all tied to social. <laughs> and everyone's like, what? Right. what? This, this is backwards. Right, right. No, and they, I know they started to make some um, some changes to try to backtrack from that. I know initially with the YouTube uh, kind of dissecting, <clears throat> I mean, um, I guess pu- pulling away from having the, the need to have a Google Plus account to do comments right. on YouTube and all that. Uh, but no, that's interesting. So so at Ford, so you, made, you really, 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 and I became known about you through your tenure with Ford and you became this social media um and I know you don't like the word guru, <laughs> but, but I was thinking, don't say it. I know. It. It. And that's why I said that, but I'm not going to, but you became known as someone who's very skilled when it came to social media and you, and people came to you for advice, uh, which, you know, I commend you for that. Um, now transitioning out of Ford and then working briefly um, at, at some agencies, you have decided now to launch this new venture, Scott Monty Strategies. And you and you did briefly say, you know, why you did it. It was the time, um, the time was ripe. But I w- we're curious to know, and I'm sure our listeners would love to know, being someone with your experience and your expertise and you, the prominent role you have had at an organization, um, what is that feeling like right now as you venture off into your own project? And again, you know, what what were some of the the, the biggest decisions that, that that made you decide that this is actually this is the consultancy that is needed at this time in the marketplace? Well, I think you said it best yourself earlier. It's both uh, exhilarating and terrifying okay. at the same time. Uh, it's it's wonderful to be able to have the freedom uh, that I do uh, to be able to because um, I, I work out of my house, mm-hmm. so I, I can have lunch with my wife. Uh, just about every day. I can go pick the kids up from school if uh, they need to be picked up. Right. Um, I can I can go have meetings off-site, uh, go have coffee with people and not feel like I'm uh, leaving someone hang out, hanging out to dry back at the office, right? <laughs> right. So there's, there's a wonderful freedom in that. At the same time, you know that there's one person who's responsible for your paycheck, uh, and ensuring that you, all the overhead gets taken care of, mm-hmm. and there's no cushion there. And and I, 
you know, I like to think that what I'm doing now is not too dissimilar from what I've done in recent years. It's just that I'm now doing my act without a net. You know, uh, I'm, <laughs> right. I'm still on the high wire, but there's no net anymore. Right. right. But that's the thing. It is very similar to what I was doing because when I was at Ford, I would get calls from from external companies, mm-hmm. you know, colleagues at, uh, you know, other big corporations, uh, you know, whether it's uh, McDonald's or uh, Cisco or Dell or what have you, for advice. You know, how did you handle this kind of thing? What are you thinking about? you know, this platform and on and on and on. And I would also get requests internally at Ford from different departments, customer service, HR, uh, even IT and legal. You know, how, how do we put together a social strategy for our department or our working group? And a lot of what I did during my time at Ford was education and consulting. Mm -hmm. And, People after you know I I would coach them through it. They said, "Yeah, you should, you should start. You should do consulting on your own." And I was always like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, whatever." <laughs> I just kind of <laughs> right. discounted it. And the more that was said to me, I'm like, you know, there there could be something there, but I have no idea where to start. Mm-hmm. So when I was um, after I left Ford and I was working with uh, Shift Communications, I mm-hmm. uh, still remained out here in Michigan, but Shift's offices were in New York, Boston, and San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And I, I would support um, all of the VPs that needed help with uh, better digital acumen or um, the perspective from somebody from a large corporate environment. Uh, so I would, I would consult with them. And the problem with that is they, they didn't have clients that had additional budget to throw around to justify bringing me in. Okay. So, you know, we had some great clients while I was at Shift, uh, like uh, the state of Hawaii, uh, you know, their, their uh, tourism bureau. Oh, wow. T-Mobile. Did you have to do a lot of uh, on-site uh, meetings over there? I wish. I wish. <laughs> Those were all virtual, unfortunately. Oh, no. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. So, um, so, you know, I, I had a lot of downtime and I just thought, well, I, I could be out there doing this on my own. Right. You know, there's, there's no need to stay within a, another company to do that. Right. So that's, that's what I did. And I positioned it that, you know, it's strategic communications mm-hmm. uh, overall, um, because by virtue of being part of a large corporation like Ford, I had uh, exposure and access to an awful lot. And I was on the corporate communications team, which mm-hmm. is like the nerve center of information uh, about what's going on with the company. Mm-hmm. And we did, certainly we did social media and digital, but we did broadcast, we did events, we did investor relations, we did crisis, mm. uh, lots of different stuff. Like I worked shoulder to shoulder with um, most of the C-suite there. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty much what my consulting has turned into is I will work with brands and agencies to help them with their strategic communications, focusing on digital executive and crisis. No, that's great. And uh, for your, as far as your clients and these brands and agencies, some of the brands, are these primarily inter- enterprise companies or small businesses or a mixture of the two? They're, they're a mix. Okay. You know, I, I counsel uh, some companies that are in the, uh, in the startup space, uh, oh. some that are in um, technology, Okay. Uh, working with uh, a, a very big uh, retail brand. Um, and I've had opportunities to consult with agencies that need help with new business pitches. Hmm. So help them buff up their, uh, their deck, their overall strategy. And if they want, you know, go with them to the pitch to help win the business. That is great. And you definitely... You know, you have the uh, the portfolio of um, of thought leadership and experience that you can bring to the table with these clients, and 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 that's what I want to really get into now, um, as far as the audience for this podcast and thinking about individuals that I like to call um, in the power phase of their lives. You know, people mm. that are kind of in between, like mid thirties to fifty Gen Xers, if you will, that uh, probably primarily, you know, either within a career on a current job or maybe looking for entrepreneurial opportunities. But let's say that someone is within that generation and they're listening in 
Um, and like you, they've had years and years of experience and they have possibly made a name for themselves or let's say they have not. And they're looking for ways to build that expertise within a company. Scott, I w- I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how does social media, this new media marketplace that we're in now of content, social, even mobile. How can someone with that that within that generation can build their personal brand Um, but utilizing the importance of digital media to do that. And how do you, how do they stay on top of these trends? Because the reason I want to focus on that too, because someone like you, you know, when you think of someone, the head of social media for a company and true, it's Ford, but a lot of times companies are looking to people in that younger generation. I say the millennials to kind of bring a fresh face, uh, a new way of thinking and you are able to really showcase your brilliance and move the train ahead with when it comes to social and you're still doing that now through your projects through your articles through flipboard um through your personal site what advice would you give someone that's in that mid power phase of their life the how would what would you tell them about the importance of digital media specifically content and social when it comes to career growth well i i think you know, you've, you've got to be in this for the right reason. Mm-hmm. Um, I, when I was at Ford, I, I wasn't doing what I was doing for the Scott Monty brand. Um, the Scott Monty brand was why Ford hired me, actually. Interesting. Um, okay. You know, they knew about me. They read my blog. They knew I was well-versed in this area. I, I had been an early thought leader in this space. Mm-hmm. Um, everything I did on behalf of Ford while I was there, you know, whether it was uh, jumping into um, forum discussions or blog posts or uh, Twitter fights or whatever it was to inform and defend uh, Ford Motor Company, you know, let them know what Ford was actually up to and dispel the um, outdated myths they were operating on. <laughs> right. I, I essentially called it digital hand-to-hand combat. <laughs> I did that because I knew it had to be done. I saw it happening, and and not a lot of people had um, had had a view into that because they weren't on the platforms. Right. Right. So, and and even after I I did that, it was kind of uh, completely opaque to the management. I mean, because they, again, they weren't on these. It's not like the the there were headlines coming out. Uh, based on who settled what debate on Twitter last night. Right. So they were oblivious to it. Right, right. So I did what I knew had to be done. And the only tool that I had at my disposal uh, that was at scale at the time was my own profiles, my own Twitter account, my own uh, blogger account, Mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, So I did what had to be done for the company. So as you're thinking about, you know, establishing some thought leadership, understand what the greater purpose is. If it's for the sake of your own career, which is fine, then there are outlets to to go to to consider that, Uh, whether it's building your own site. And it's easier than ever now with, you know, whether it's Bluehost or Squarespace or whatever you want to use. um, Building a site now from scratch is fairly easy. it's a matter of participating where other people that you want to influence are or people that have already influenced you. you know, a great way to do that is to comment on their content. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and as we've said for years, make this a conversation. Um, and it's only, that, it's only by people getting to know you mm-hmm. that they will grant you the title of thought leader. Mm. And I, I like, like you said before, I, I don't like the term guru. Um, now, that, that comes with a proviso. I will not call myself a guru. If other people want to call me a guru, that's their business. Right. It's the same thing with thought leadership. You can't call yourself a thought leader. It's what your peers grant upon you that matters. Mm. No, that makes sense. Uh, and sounds and the only way to your point that your peers will grant that upon you is by your actions. Um, right. So you have to you have to focus on the actions and the activity 
um, and a lot of times I've seen the mistake of people would do the reverse. <laughs> they would, they would, right. and it's not, you know, and I understand it because when you're trying to build a personal brand, you're trying to break out, you have to be proactive at, you know, getting your voice out there, but, um, you know, doing it without inaction and, and, and you calling yourself a, a thought leader and a guru over and over and over and over again and having, you know, 20 million hashtags in your Twitter bio um, yeah. may, <laughs> may not do it for you. Um, but curious and curious to hear. And that was some great advice, by the way. And to your point, for people that are looking to build a brand, you have to know why you're doing it for the for, for the personal reasons or for the company. But you have to. And I, and I want to repeat that you have to participate in those forums, in those places in the areas that, that the people that you're trying to influence are participating in or, right. or that you're influenced by. I think that was some really great advice. Um, and then as we wrap up thinking about social, I'm curious to hear, cause you, you mentioned conversation. What's your thought on Twitter, the state of Twitter right now, because I'm starting to see less and less and less of the act of conversation as of now, you know, as opposed to, kind of the uh, just marketing and blasting of links. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious to hear, especially coming from you, what's your thought of that? And and also, um, what's your thought of Jack's return to uh, t- to the company? So I saw a, um, a trend last week called Give Twitter a Slogan, where people were trying to be helpful. At, you know, Twitter's on this comeback now. Jack is there. They, they, they want to see it succeed. Right. And one of the slogans was Twitter, Shouting into the void together, alone. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it's become. And I think the, the challenge with Twitter, the, and this has always been the challenge with Twitter, is that people think that because it's 140 characters, that it's a really simple technology. It's really easy to understand. I would argue that the reverse is true. With only 140 characters, it is incredibly nuanced what Twitter is and how it can be used. Mm-hmm. And Twitter is basically as good as you make it. Mm. You know, it's not Facebook, which I saw a statistic this week that year on year postings to Facebook, that is how frequently individuals are posting, um, has dropped. Right? So people are pulling back the amount of content that they're sharing on Facebook. Now, is this for both right. uh, profile and pages or? Did, this did... is for individuals. Okay, okay, got it. Okay. Got it. Now, when you consider the way Facebook works, it's a very, or can be a very passive uh, experience. You open your phone or your laptop and you're just scrolling through the feed, right? Seeing what your friends are up to. Right. And maybe you'll... Give it a like here or there. That's that's what I call a digital grunt, <laughs> right? Because right. it's the it's the least commitment you can ask for. Right? Digital <laughs> digital grunt. Ugh. Or, like or, or the possi- or the possible dislike, which I'm not sure if that's actually coming yeah. to fruition or not, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. A grunt, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. So um, so it's a very passive experience, right? When people take that behavior and open up Twitter, it becomes completely inane. Why? Because Twitter was always presaged on this notion of communication, of two-way conversation. That's a great place to have a discourse with people back and forth. Right. And I think a lot of people are either waiting to get notified through that mentions button. Mm -hmm. And again, Twitter has made it very easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, They always have. You just hit that mentions button to see when people are talking about you. Right. But if you want to dive deeper, if you want to look into search, uh, if you want to search topics or search by geography or whatever, you really have to dig to unearth that part of Twitter. And it strikes me that if Twitter and and look, they're they're starting to come around now with this moments feature. Yes, yes. Uh, which is uh, you know a step in the right direction. It's not exactly where they need to be, but what they've done is they've curated uh, content around particular topics that are happening, um, you know, either locally or nationally or, or what have you. So it, it, it almost pre-selects that, that search function for you. Right. But absent a better search function where people can say, well, who's talking about, um, who's talking about the World Series or who's talking about the New York Marathon or whatever? Um, if Twitter hasn't put that in a moment, it's really difficult to find that. Right. And 
I think people need to be more proactive on Twitter in terms of finding those conversations, jumping into something and not being afraid to get in the middle of a, a back and forth simply by virtue of what's coming across their screen. So bottom line, with Twitter, you have to work hard to curate the feed that you want that gives you the most interactivity. Right. No, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, for me, Twitter has always been the brand of uh, immediacy. And, you know, I think it's it's real power in its punch is um, the real time nature. But to your point, it, you have to understand how to jump in, when to jump in and the best way to curate that. Um, and I think their purchase of Periscope as well in their venture into live streaming, you know, really may, uh, which everyone's doing now. You have even you have Facebook mentions, you have Periscope, you have Blab. Right. So I'm right. curious to see how. Uh, who it in and to me is not an either or. And to me, you know, Periscope has its place. <clears throat> Blab has its place. One to me, one is one to one, more one to one, which is scope. And mm-hmm. Blab is one to many. So, you know, I get questions even for me when I do consulting or just conversations, you know, which one should I be on? Blab or Periscope? Well, what is your strategy? Who are you trying to reach? And there's room for both. Um right. that's right. That's that, that's my thought. Uh, Scott, this, this is, this has truly been a great conversation and, you know, you, you definitely, um, I, I, I could have said it better. You, you mentioned that, you know, when, when you came to Ford, you know, they wanted to invite you into the fold because of the brand that you've already built. So, you know, you've already recognized the importance of new media, social media, and digital platforms when it comes to engagement. And you brought that to the table at Ford. So that was, that's really great. Um, insight. Now, before we wrap up, I have two questions that I always ask my guest, Scott, at the end of the show. <laughs> and uh, the first one's a little fun. You know, you, you'll be ready for this. Uh, and then we'll drop a little bit more knowledge on Value Bomb. So the first one, Scott, if there was a song that would play every time you enter a room or when you walk down the street that fits perfectly your story and the brand of Scott Monty, what song would that be? Basically, what would be your own personal theme song and why? Wow, that is tough. Um, <laughs> now, you see, to make matters more complicated, I'm, I'm kind of a music dork. Oh, me too. Me well, too. Probably not in the same way you are. I mean, I, I, and I, the accent is on dork, not on music. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, am a, I don't collect, but I'm an aficionado of... Um, original scores, no, so m- movie soundtracks. I love music. Uh, I'm love movie. I'm a John Williams and Hans, and I love all that stuff. Okay. All right. Well, you're you're more dorky than I gave you credit. <laughs> <laughs> I am, man. I am. I am. Okay. Okay. Um, and and John Williams is obviously a particular favorite. Uh, coming from Boston, as I do, he was the conductor of the Boston Pops for many years. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I was a member of a uh, a service fraternity when I was in college. It was a music fraternity, and we inducted John Williams as an honorary brother. Um, wow. I think it was my first year of grad school. It was just after I graduated. He had announced he was retiring from the Pops, and uh, he came to our ceremony, and I got to meet him, and it was an amazing thing. Wow, that is awesome. See, I'm a, I'm a huge, like, Star Wars geek, so uh, the fact that you, uh, no, that's that's great. And, and plus, I just love his other scores as he, that he's done. Yeah. Superman, yeah. Superman, and, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big John Williams fan. I okay, mean, so that's a great story. All, all of those movies that have, have been made or that, that are in the public uh, perception because of his music being part of it. Oh, yes. The opening to Star Wars, the Superman march, um, the barrel chase scene in Jaws. I saw that performed at the Pops. Oh, wow. With and without music. They had a big screen behind the orchestra, and they played the scene without music. And it was, it was you know, it's a Steven Spielberg movie, so it was still good. Right. It seemed kind of flat. And then they, they re-looped the film, and John queued up the orchestra, and he conducted them with the exact cues to the to the scene and it was like magic it was amazing it was absolutely amazing wow okay okay Uh, so that's a that's a long way of getting around to um my musical selection um and i'm gonna go gee it's so tough because so many of the movie composers have so many different things and i'm gonna go back 
to what inspired movie composers of the modern era to our old friend Ludwig von Beethoven. Okay. Symphony number no. seven. Mm. To me, and nine always gets the uh, gets the airplay because people know Ode to Joy. Right. Uh, or or five, they know dun 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 dun. Right. But to me, seven has always been great because it really expresses a whole range of human emotion. Mm-hmm. And Beethoven was someone who he lived a hard life. You know, um, he he started losing his hearing. Um, when he was still in his 20s. And most of his major compositions that we know him for, he did with severe, if not total, hearing loss. Um, by the time the Ninth Symphony came around, he couldn't even hear it be performed. Mm. Um, and the Seventh really speaks to man the, the depths of man's sorrow and the heights of his triumph. Mm. And to me, that really that, that espouses challenges that I've been up against successes that I've had and uh, actually like Beethoven uh, I actually have some hearing loss myself okay so I I sympathize with him wow that that is that is an awesome choice that's the first time we had a classical uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm a big music junkie so I could appreciate it uh, symphony number four movements uh, I, I, I love I love the choice I love the choice all right okay Great, great selection. And then uh, the last question, Scott, um, is if there was one specific tool or resource, it could be a book, it could be a website or an app um, that you recommend, particularly to Gen Xers leaders who want to become a stronger leader and build a brand in this social media, new media landscape, what would it be? (laughs) Well, I could be completely self-serving and say (laughs) scottmonty.com. Other than Scott and Monty. Well, everyone is listening. You have to go to his website anyway. But <laughs> besides Scott and Monty. I mean, but, and, you, could, you, could, you could choose that. But, uh, but well, well, the one thing there I will say, and not the site in general, but the newsletter that I put out every mm-hmm. Monday, okay, which is a very carefully curated set of links um, with analysis and commentary okay, that give you a sense as to what's the most important, um, what are the most important bits of news uh, from the digital marketplace from the past week. Okay. Right. So I, I search and 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 call the news so you don't have to. Wow. Okay. That's great. That's great. It so, comes out. It comes out when? Uh, it comes out every Monday. Every Monday. If you just go to scottmonty.com, you can click on uh, the week in digital to uh, subscribe to just that, or you can subscribe to the whole site. I love. One, uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say what, just more broadly, though, uh, for folks that that do want a uh, a tool, um, there is an app that I've had for quite some time, and uh, I found it, uh, it. It's mostly very useful. I mean, some of it is touch and go, um, but it comes out uh, every single day, and that is um, it's the Harvard Business Review uh, app, and it's got it's got management tips. Okay. Uh, Harvard management tips and um, it's called the HBR tip okay. or the management tip um, and every weekday it's got a very short you know kind of one screen uh, type thing and uh, it helps you become a better leader it helps you stay connected to uh, what's going on in the digital marketplace and uh, I highly recommend it okay that was the Harvard Business Review HBR uh, management tip, tip. management yep. tip Awesome choices. Scott, this has been a great, great conversation. It's definitely been an honor um, chatting with you. A lot of a lot of value bombs, and I love the way we ended it off talking about my man Beethoven. Um, that is uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that that is a classic way to end it. Let everyone know the best way that they can find out more about you. You mentioned your website. Um, is that the best way for people to know about you, about what you're doing with your business? Yeah, just go to scottmonty.com. Um, you know, I've got uh, updates there uh, just as they come to me. Okay. Um, I, just, I just ranted uh, off the charts this morning about uh, LinkedIn. Um, obviously, won't be getting any business from them anytime soon, but um, <laughs> <laughs> or who knows? Maybe I will. Um, but that, no, I, and I know I why. He, he, he recently, well, by the time this airs, well, you just, I read the great article you wrote uh, on LinkedIn. <laughs> no, it was very interesting but look I'll always love your perspectives though 
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, you're getting the straight dope, right? You are definitely getting the straight dope. From, from the straight dope. <laughs> <laughs> great. great. No, that's great. So, Scott, it's been a pleasure. And everyone, also, for you listening in, you Gen Xers that are fans of the Detective Wonder Sherlock Holmes, check out his site and podcast i hear of sherlock everywhere it's actually pretty great uh, we've talked a lot about social but if you're into some really good pop culture and some sherlock stuff check it out as well scott thank you so much for spending time with me it's been a pleasure and spending time with our exceptional gen x amplified audience fantastic thank you so much adrian take care okay that was good that was fun that was fun that was uh <laughs> that was that was a good conversation. That was Scott Monty from Scott Monty Strategies, formerly the head of all of social media for Ford Motor Company. I want to thank Scott for spending time with me, with us today. He is by far one of the most revered. <laughs> revered social media experts in the marketplace and i was very thrilled to have such a great conversation with him really really smart guy definitely follow him on twitter check out his website at scottmonty.com where he consistently publishes some great and valuable content especially for those of you who are looking to up your game when it comes to social media and marketing in general Please remember, if you want to read the show notes and get the links to the resources that he and I discuss, please go over to genxamplified.com forward slash zero two three. And also, since we discuss new media and entrepreneurship, I have for you a brand new and free download PDF that I put together that's in the show notes. And it's basically a resource list that you can download and it's called 10 Tools Every Entrepreneur Needs in this new media marketplace. (laughs) Definitely check that out. Uh, The tools that I listed are the ones that I highly recommend and the majority of them I actually use. So for anyone that's looking to build and grow a business in this digital landscape, definitely check out the download. Um, Remember, I just want to provide as much value as I can through this podcast, through my other platforms. So that will do it for this episode. I appreciate you so much for your download and for listening in. And as always, it's because of you that I do what I do. So remember, go build your personal brand, amplify your story so you can maximize your impact in this new media marketplace. Thank you so much. And all the best to your success. Take care.